This recording is from the 1950 SWP convention. The topic of discussion is Yugoslavia and related questions. The first speaker is Murray Weiss for the majority. The second speaker is John G. Wright for a minority. The third speaker is Johnson for the Johnson Forest Tendency, another minority. Then there are contributions by E.R. Frank, Jim Cannon, Rhea Stone, probably others that aren't on the tape. Summaries of the reports are given first by Wright and the second summary by Weiss again. The basic motivation of our resolution that is before you for adoption, discussion, its point of departure is that we have a worker state in Yugoslavia established by the victory of the proletarian revolution. This is the essence of the approach of the resolution. In the larger sense, the resolution sums up the historical process the peculiar interaction of objective and subjective factors which led to the establishment of a worker state in Yugoslavia. What kind of party led this revolution and what the prospects for its further development are. The resolution must also be considered as a defense of the general political line we have followed with regard to the Yugoslavs and the Yugoslav Communist Party, the Convention must answer the question. Were we right in our vigorous intervention since the break between Tito and Stalin? Our resolution, by developing the analysis and formulating a precise characterization of the class character of Yugoslavia and the YCP, deepens the intervention of the Trotskyist movement in the struggle, affirms the correctness of our basic line of action, and lays the groundwork for our further course. Recently, we have acquired additional evidence of the progressive development of the revolution in Yugoslavia, particularly with reference to the struggle against bureaucratic deformations in favor of basing the young worker state more firmly upon the people's committees, decentralization, raising the participation of the workers in management and control of industry. But we also have before us the continuation and acceleration of a right turn in foreign policy. This turn places the very existence of the Yugoslav revolution in jeopardy. It poses the question, is this turn an irrevocable capitulation the brutal pressure of Western imperialism? Or does it offer another in a series of warnings, the gravest of all thus far, that without the firm policy of revolutionary internationalism, the Yugoslav revolution will be destroyed? Now, in this report, we rule out of consideration as far as polemic treatment, the Stalinists, the Social Democrats, and centrists, Shackmanites. Stalinists, that's a job of exposing frame ups and slander. Social Democrats and centrists who belatedly saw the possibilities in the Yugoslav development, only to seize on to the worst features 
of the Yugoslav Communist Party and its policies to become more Titoists than the Titoists and the Shachmanites. They're not in our class camp. Altogether different is the challenge to our position from comrades within our party. The Johnson Forrest tendency who vigorously oppose our analysis and our tactical line will be dealt with. Their opposition stems from basic theoretical and methodological differences. To be carefully distinguished from this tendency are those comrades who, while not counterposing a resolution to ours, or even in certain cases subscribing to the main line of our resolution, have raised a number of questions and reservations. We shall attempt to maintain the necessary distinction in the treatment of these two separate and distinct controversies. Before the Second World War, Yugoslavia was ruled by a monarchy, tied up with a church, with fascist gangs, dominated by foreign imperialists, a parasitic native bourgeoisie linked with big landlords, no legal workers movement. In addition to the general oppression of this country by the imperialists, an internal oppression of a whole host of nationalities, a small prison of the peoples, 80% agrarian, a typical culturally backward Balkan country. In one decade, this nation experienced a seething social, economic, and political revolution destroyed the whole political structure of the old order, expelled the foreign imperialists, removed those twin curses of feudalism, the monarchy and the church, from political domination, destroyed the capitalist class and the big landlords, laid the basis for a real solution of the national question began on the road of industrialization and electrification under a plan, made beginnings in collectivization, broke with the Kremlin, experienced a cultural awakening, introduced important changes in the field of workers and control and management, experienced an ideological development from Stalinism towards Marxism, What brought all this into being? All this is the work of that mainspring of social progress, what Trotsky called the indubitable feature of every revolution, the direct interference of the masses in historic events. After the conquest of Yugoslavia by the Nazis and fascists in April 1941, the first stage of the War of National Liberation opens. According to all the evidence, the Yugoslav Communist Party is on the scene from the first days, calling for uprisings, organizing resistance. But the early period of the resistance has a localized, predominantly peasant character, a relatively easy target for the powerful Nazi forces that are now occupying the country. The movement comes to a crisis, a series of military defeats pose the question of the very existence of the liberation war. And I want to now direct attention to the first crucial sign of the qualitative distinction between this partisan movement and many of the others that we heard about in Europe. 
the formation of the proletarian brigades on December 21st, 1941. I want to quote from Tito in his political report to the Central Committee of the Communist Party of Yugoslavia in 1948. He says, with reference to these localized movements, he says, the experience of the struggle in Serbia showed that armed uprising must be developed not only in breadth and number, that is quantitatively, but qualitatively as well. It was shown that real military units must be formed, capable of leaving their own territories and fighting wherever it was necessary, and wherever they are ordered to do so. Even though the partisan detachments were formed from the very beginning, formed as military formations, battalions, companies, platoons, and although firm military discipline was maintained, these units nevertheless had more of a territorial character, defended their own area in the main, their villages and homes. Therefore, they had a local character, and as such were not capable of mobile warfare of leaving their own territory and fighting in other parts of the country. On the other hand, we continue to develop and create territorial partisan detachments. It was from such detachments that the new fighters who had already had their christening of fire kept pouring into the regular units. In this connection, the Supreme Headquarters formed the proletarian shock brigade immediately after the withdrawal from Serbia. And again he says, the proletarian brigades were thus named first because the brigades were made up mostly of proletarians, workers from the cities, factories and mines who had shown not only a high class consciousness but also exemplary courage and loyalty to the party and the people in all previous battles. Second, they were thus named because in those awful days that name meant an uncompromising life and death struggle because the people were convinced by deeds during those hard days that only the working class led by the CPY was a consistent, uncompromising fighter against the invader. This role for the proletarian brigades, in our opinion, is one of the essential features marking the transformation of a national liberation war into a class war, marking that feature which is so penetratingly analyzed by the theory of permanent revolution of how a national war against imperialism cannot really reach the heights and pose the possibility of victory without the proletariat taking the helm. This national liberation war led by the CPY in which the proletariat from the beginning played a distinctive role develops into a civil war. The remnants of the old Yugoslav army headed by Mikhailovich becomes the rallying center, the capitalists. And here we find another important peculiarity that we must direct attention to. We mustn't imagine that the split between Mikhailovich and the partisans occurs at once under the pressure of the Kremlin, of the Allied imperialists, there occurs an uneasy period in which negotiations take place. But very quickly the reality becomes that Mikhailovich, the representative of the native bourgeoisie and of Allied imperialism, collaborates with the fascists and the Nazis, and in the question of 
positional warfare on the military side finds himself in the rear of the partisans many times with an attack while the partisans are facing the Germans and the Italians. This does not make for collaboration. It sets up a certain contradiction between the reality of the struggle which is developing into an all-national class war and the line of the Kremlin. They set up the proletarian brigades and they deepened their split with Mikhailovich. And it is interesting to quote Piyari who writes about the legend that the Yugoslav uprising owed its existence to Soviet assistance and does a, a devastating job destroying that legend. He quotes a dispatch from Moscow to Tito dated March 5th, 1942. And Moscow writes as follows. Reference to Mikhailovich and all the other problems that are developing. Study of all the information you give lends one the impression that the adherence of Great Britain and the Yugoslav government, that is the Yugoslav government in London with the king, have some justification in suspecting the partisan movement of acquiring a communist character and aiming at the Sovietization of Yugoslavia. Why, for example, did you need to form a special proletarian brigade? Surely at the moment, the basic immediate task is to unite all anti-Nazi currents, smash the invaders, achieve national liberation. How is one to explain the fact that supporters of Great Britain are, succeeded in, are succeeding in forming armed units against the partisan detachments. Are there really no other Yugoslav patriots apart from the communists and communist sympathizers with whom you could join in common struggle against the invaders? It is difficult to agree that London and the Yugoslav government are siding with the invaders. There must be some great misunderstanding here. We earnestly request you to give your tactics altogether serious thought and your actions, and make sure that on your side you have really done all you can to achieve a true united national front of all enemies of Hitler and Mussolini and Yugoslavia in order to attain the common aim. Tito, after receiving this letter, writes a letter to Piatti, who is up in the mountains, with a small group of partisans, the representative of the Central Committee, waiting for Soviet assistance to come by airplane for 38 days. Nothing comes. And he receives this letter. Tito says, your observation about the common harness of the Yugoslav government and Mikhailovich and Nadich is correct. But Grandad, that's Moscow, finds difficulty in crediting it. A day or two, I got a letter a mile long from him in which he says that our reports give him the impression that the partisan movement is getting deeper and deeper into communist waters. Otherwise, how would it be possible for supporters of London to organize the Chetniks against us? Further, he asks why it was necessary to form a special proletarian brigade. He wants us to revise our policy and create a broad national liberation front. We see, therefore, that the national liberation war which deepened into a civil war, the class essence of which is the proletariat and the peasantry against all the possessing classes and the imperialists, this class civil war immediately poses the question of power. The whole of the possessing classes and all its old institutions support either the fascist invader or Mikhailovich. 
As the partisans clear territories, the problem of governmental authority arises. From the very beginning, it becomes an irreconcilable issue separating the partisans from the Chetniks. In this report to the Fifth Congress, There is a quotation from the documents pertaining to a proposed agreement with Mikhailovich and the partisans, and the partisans presented this point. They said, the organization of a temporary authority which would concern itself with the feeding of the population, the organization of the economy, the collection of means for waging the war, the establishment of organs to maintain order and security, etc., in our opinion, it would be absolutely wrong in the present national liberation struggle to have this authority represented by district sheriff's office, the old district administrations, the gendarmerie, etc., in order to rally all the people for the waging of this difficult struggle against the invader, it is necessary that we create organs that will best correspond to this situation and will be closest to the people and will be able to take upon themselves all responsibilities in the name of the people. The former gendarmerie, police, and district apparatus, the district organs as well, cannot today be considered as suitable, for many hostile elements have made their way into this apparatus, because the apparatus has up to the present been in the service of the invaders and the enemy, and still influence over it through their agents. Besides, that apparatus which does not particularly enjoy the trust of the people is not suitable in these fateful days. We think that the National Liberation Committees, set up by the people themselves, are at present the most suitable organs upon which we could rely. These National Liberation Committees must be voluntarily chosen by the people regardless of political uh, conviction, and so on. It develops the point not that the theory of Marxism, unfortunately, this is not the approach, requires the destruction of the old state apparatus of the bourgeoisie and its replacement by a new state apparatus based on the masses in struggle. He develops rather the empirical observation that the old state apparatus is in the service of the invader and of the ruling class collaborator, and the new state apparatus is the only force that can organize the resistance and carry on the war. A fundamentally different line than that pursued by the Stalinists in other countries. This stage culminates in the formation of a provisional government after they've had some military successes and succeeded in grouping together liberated territories. On November 23rd at Yuzich, this government is formed based on the People's Committees. The situation of dual power, which from the first day of the Liberation War is expressed in the whole situation in the country, here rises to a new high point. Where is the power of the bourgeoisie in Yugoslavia? It's in Mikhailovich. It's in the Nazi invader, the Italian fascists. All the remnants of bourgeois power are grouped around them. What is this new power that arises, led by the Yugoslav Communist Party? Based on those proletarians formed in these brigades and the peasantry in mortal struggle against their class enemy. Are they consciously aware of this? Not fully. That's the reality. That's the development. The logic of the revolution forces the YCP into taking the revolutionary steps. And this causes a clash at every point with the designs the world program of the Stalinists and the Kremlin. 
We could illustrate at great length how every forward movement of the Yugoslav revolution is punctuated by a rift with the common term, with the Kremlin. And in this process, we see the transformation of a party. Here we see how the revolution, with its enormous mass pressure, can, under certain conditions, favorable conditions to be sure, unique conditions in a certain respect, take a Stalinist party and press it into service, cause it to depart from its usual course. An inevitable question arises at this point in relation to those comrades who have expressed doubts on this question. They say, does the whole question of the revolutionary party then become one of fatalism, pressure of the masses, and sees any party, even Stalinist parties, and express itself through that party and the revolution triumphs? The worker state is established? No one has presented the question, at least I hope no one has, in such a vulgarized form. There's no fatalism involved here. The subjective factor operated. Not on the highest level, but it operated. Leaders of the Yugoslav Communist Party had to make decisions. They weren't sitting in Moscow as they themselves repeat so often, almost boastfully. And they have certain rights to boast in this case. They said, we didn't hear about the liberation war in Adasha outside Moscow over the radio. They were in the hills. They were leading workers and peasants. They were being tested on the fire. They thought that this was the strategy of the world revolution. There was a certain mold of men. They could have made other decisions. There's nothing fatalistic in this. We don't hear about those revolutions that didn't take place because people failed to make the decisions that these people made. Halting, empirical, weighed down by the old Stalinist opportunism, they nevertheless broke through. They succumbed to the pressure of the proletariat. It's better to succumb to the pressure of the proletariat than to the pressure of the bourgeoisie or the Stalinist bureaucracy. Thomas Trotsky in sort of a digression in his autobiography, attempts to formulate a historical law concerning objective and subjective factors. That's the essence of what he's talking about. He says, broadly speaking, the entire historical process is a refraction of the historical law through the accidental. In the language of biology, one might say that the historical law is realized through the natural selection of accidents. On this foundation, there develops that conscious human activity which subjects the accident to a process of artificial selection. The leadership of the Yugoslav Communist Party in a certain sense, fall in between these two poles. A product of accidental selection approaching that which is the essence of the party, consciousness. It's very interesting to understand this business about their temporary separation from Moscow during decisive periods of the revolution in this light. The accident of the breakdown of a radio connection. The formation of parties and successful revolutions do not depend on such accidents. But such accidents fall into line in the sequence of events when there is sufficient force, consciousness, and objective forces pave a way to their use. Now, the next stage of the Yugoslav Revolution opens with the tito subasic Agreement, which started in June 1944. Tito himself, 
in his report quoting the document of the agreement says on his part the Marshal of Yugoslavia, Joseph Tito, as President of the National Committee of Liberation of Yugoslavia, will make public the statement on cooperation with Dr. Subasic government. The same government, incidentally, with a little shift in personnel, which supported Mikhailovich, just stabbing the partisan movement in the back. Will make public the statement on cooperation with Dr. Subasic government and will once more emphasize that the National Committee of Liberation of Yugoslavia will not raise the question of the final state system during the war. And then he explains, and he explains and explains throughout this report. I'll read one brief explanation. We had to consent to this, as it was the condition of the Allies for recognition of the new state of affairs in Yugoslavia that came about in the course of the war with the ever more obvious victory of the National Liberation Movement. It doesn't mention here the Allies and the Stalinist regime in Russia. We've got to remember the picture of this war. They are fighting without material. They are going into battles with 5, 10, 15 bullets per soldier. They are waiting year after year for assistance from the Red Army and they don't get it. As a matter of fact, later on, they discover that and not only did they fail to receive assistance, <coughs> they discover that the Red Army was dickering with Mikhailovich to find some kind of agreement with him, offering him all kinds of assistance. You got to remember that they armed themselves by disarming the enemy. Here, this agreement with the Subasic regime has partly the character of squeezing the partisans in the last days of their warfare. Either make this agreement, or you don't get real assistance. They've been bleeding for three years. There's no excuse for it. It's not a lawyer's plea for opportunism. There's no understanding the specific type of opportunism of this specific type of party in this condition without understanding those conditions. The revolution develops nevertheless. Even after the agreement leads to a joint government with these representatives of the bourgeoisie. It develops on the basis of the real power, the committees. You see the beginning of important social transformations. The nationalization of industry begins. And all this process of the revolution, as it reaches the pinnacle of its military successes, caused the last two bourgeois ministers to leave in October 1945. First to split with Mikhailovich, despite the pressure of the Kremlin and the Allies. The formation of a provisional government based on the committees, raising the dual power in the country to a high point. An agreement with the bourgeoisie which still leaves open the question of the final course of the development of this revolution. However weak and meager the development of this bourgeoisie is, Tito and the others say how they understood what they meant by the Subasic government coming into coalition with theirs. They're going to try to bring the king back. The king was going to be a Trojan horse and all the landlords and the capitalists and all the other ruling class elements would march in under that cover. The convention or the uh, Congress that he's addressing laughs. They outwitted them. Still getting by by empirical moves, the power of the revolution, the weakness of the bourgeoisie. 
The revolution goes forward. There's no disputing it. It passes the moment of the break with the Subasic government. And from the time of the departure of the remaining bourgeois ministers in October 1945, the revolution experiences a development up to its next most important stage, the split with the Kremlin in June 1948. Nationalizations are broadened. A monopoly of foreign trade is established. This is the period where they begin collectivizations in agriculture. A five-year plan is adopted. Industrialization and electrification of the country under this plan is opened up. These years are also marked by a certain growth of bureaucracy. A bureaucracy not fully differentiated from the proletariat, not hardened as yet. A bureaucracy that hasn't developed into a privileged caste in the full sense of the word. But the methods, the heritage, the Stalinist training, where consciousness is so important in the development of a new state of the working class, and where that consciousness is absent and its place is found Stalinist ideas, the pressure of bureaucracy that arises so forcefully in a backward country makes its way. But here we have the next stage, the break with the Kremlin. The National Liberation War, which from the first developed into a civil war and grew into a socialist revolution, it was this that could not be contained within the framework of Stalinism. Not only ideologically, but in the deepest social and economic sense. The revolution was not the replacement of the old state apparatus by appointees from the Stalinist Kremlin. It raised the class to its feet. It conquered power through years of terrible warfare. The whole impulse of that revolution was to reorganize the economy of the country, to take steps towards socialist construction. That could not be contained by Stalinism in Eastern Europe. For all their empiricism in the very first. The leadership of the YCP begins to understand this. Shortly after the break in a pamphlet, The Real Reasons Behind the Slanders Against Yugoslavia, Tito, in reporting to one of the conferences, says it is sufficient to read various papers and listen to various broadcasts, not only from Western Europe, but from Budapest, Bucharest, Prague, Warsaw, Sofia, etc., to grasp immediately, without much perspicacity, that the whole, what the whole thing is all about. It becomes clear, then, how we have sinned. And that the thing is that we want to build socialism as soon as possible. And that we are actually building it. The whole thing is that we are industrializing the country, giving it electricity. We are not remaining a backward agricultural country which only delivers its raw materials to other countries, which then ship us the finished goods. The thing is that our country should not continue to remain a mere source of raw materials for those countries which have already possessed an advanced industry. It cannot keep on buying industrial products from them at high prices, which is being done today, and which was done in the past, while our peoples continue to remain poor and backward, with a low standard of living and culture, having to put up with hardships and misery as best they can, and then being called the backward and uncivilized Balkans. This is putting the finger on the main source of the struggle. And it didn't come out of the clear blue sky. It was a process. 
in which the development of the YCP is intertwined with the development of the revolution in conflict not only with the class enemy but with the Stalin's bureaucracy and finally comes to the surface, to the attention of the whole world <coughs> in the break with the Kremlin. If the Tito-Stalin break disclosed the living form of a proletarian revolution, it also deepened our evaluation of Stalinism and the very essence of counter-revolution. And this break also brought to the surface the real nature of this YCP. I'm not going to deal with some of these superficial explanations that are very irritating particularly to the degree that they don't concern themselves with the facts. They don't bother to look into the real nature of the development. It's not worth going into a discussion with those that say it was two gangs. One gang wanted to take the loot for itself, broke with the other gang, because even on the theory of Gang warfare, all the laws of gang warfare as I know them have been defied here. The first law of gang warfare is when a more powerful gang appears, and no matter how devoted you are to your own gang leader, you desert him. Bad feeling about it, but you desert him. Maybe here and there, particularly in Hollywood movies, somebody goes down with the leader. The last gun battle. But by and large, gang lieutenants shift over at once. It was a question of two unscrupulous gangs. The whole lieutenancy, the whole second line cadre in Yugoslavia would have voted to a man with the Kremlin. That's where the power is. That's where you go, where the power is, if it's a gang warfare problem. What motivated this almost unanimous rejection of the demands of the Kremlin. These superficial explanations don't explain. The split with the Kremlin had unexpected results for the Stalins. They launched a ferocious attack on all fronts. I don't think it was anything like it. There was never anything like it except the attack on the Trotskyists. First time since the murderous assault on the left opposition within Russia and internationally that all the stops were pulled out. The whole world press of Stalinism, all its military and secret police apparatus were, mo were mobilized up to the point of calling publicly for the assassination of Tito. And rather than having the results that the GPU expected, there's a boomerang, wide international repercussions. Titoism appears in all the Eastern countries, Eastern European countries, and in Western Europe. It becomes a major phenomenon of a developing split and breakup in Stalinist parties. Our intervention, the moment of the split, is predicated on an appreciation the heterogeneity of these massive Stalinist parties. We saw the first serious break, an opening, our worldwide campaign sought to develop this break, to reach the consciousness of the masses of workers, not only in Yugoslavia, but in every country of the world. We saw a basis for action, and only our tendency saw this. <coughs> Important changes occurred after the break with the Kremlin. The revolution moves forward. You see a struggle against bureaucratism. Again, to deal with the superficial rejection of this struggle, of this reality. 
when it doesn't, this rejection and those who reject it don't concern themselves with the facts, but simply quote what we had to say yesterday against what we're saying today, it would be fruitless to reduce this struggle that's taking place in Yugoslavia to demagogy, to compare it with the Stalinist struggle in Russia against bureaucratism. It's ridiculous. In the document of the Johnson Forest tendency, they say, in Russia, every purge is preceded by a great struggle against bureaucratism. But that's not the experience in Yugoslavia. You can't organize a whole country in a vast propaganda campaign against bureaucratism with real measures to introduce the activity of the working class into industry simply in order to disguise your real intention, which is to increase the bureaucracy, becomes like what the old man said, uh, you build a skyscraper to hide a mouse. These important changes were noted by us. We deepened our intervention. When signs of ideological development appeared, we took advantage of them. We discussed Trotskyism with communist workers and leaders in Yugoslavia. We found new avenues to the Stalinist workers in Europe. Did we close our eyes to the shortcomings? Did we become Titoists? Absolutely not. On the basis of conjunctural shifts, Comrades may feel that they were over-enthusiastic the day before yesterday. Well, it's good to learn the lesson not to be either over-enthusiastic or over-pessimistic. But our line of intervention was based firmly on an understanding of the limitations, the empiricism, the Stalinist heritage. But it was just as firmly based on the idea that he was a break it was a development. We had to reach out, deal with it, help it. Not sit back and predict that it's doomed. We recognized the transformation. We tried with all our might to see that this transformation went all the way. We worked for the optimum variant. If anyone is then going to examine exaggerations, over-enthusiasm in the course of an action which requires so much exertion, so much pressure, of course they'll find it. But they will not find that we misunderstood the essential essence of what Titoism was. We worked and we will continue to work for every possible success in the development of a revolutionary regroupment under the banner of Trotskyism exploiting to the limit all the breaks and splits in Stalinist parties. Now, the Johnson Forest tendency is absolutely incapable of grasping the Yugoslav reality. To them, and this is a quote, Titoism is pure, conscious, and consistent Stalinism. A party that leads the revolution with all its grave weaknesses, a party that comes to the power with the revolutionary masses at its back, is identical with a party that murdered a revolution. At least a party that murdered the revolutionary party in Russia. That's an identity. This is revolutionary politics. They say that if a Communist Party of the West were to defy the Kremlin, that would be significant. On this we agree. In no support for Tito, Comrade J.R. says, mobilization of a mass Communist Party, even by Togliatti or Torres in defiance of the common form, or the Russian regime, would be an event of worldwide significance for the revolutionary movement, however empirical or halting might be the ideological basis on which such a defiance might begin. That's not a small concession. This would be significant. They can also see in this same article, quote, 
When the Yugoslav Communist Party rejected the German state power during the war, it was able to lead a struggle with genuinely revolutionary characteristics. That also is true. But they refused to recognize the intertwining of these two factors in the actual process of the liberation and civil war. A struggle with genuine revolutionary characteristics and a defiance of the Kremlin, which culminated in the break in 1948. The coming to power of the Yugoslav workers under the real conditions of this revolution leaves them bewildered and dissatisfied. And this, comrades, is because they are in that terrible position of being prisoners of a schema, a false theory. Revolution in property relations in Yugoslavia is a matter of indifference to them. It is a stage of capitalism. And there's no use quoting at great length all the Marxist authorities on the question of private property and capitalist system of production. Johnson Forrest's tendency do not deny that Marxism has since the time of the Communist Manifesto and before placed the abolition of private property and the means of production as a task of the proletarian revolution. Their contention is, one, that private property is not an indispensable characteristic of capitalism, and two, the abolition of private property, the complete statification of industry and transport, <coughs> planning, the elimination of the class of private capitalists, the destruction of the state apparatus serving the class of private monopoly capitalist cliques is not necessarily the task of the proletariat. As a matter of fact, they say that in this stage of capitalism, the tendency, the dominant tendency, is for the bureaucracy of labor which everywhere assumes the characteristics of Stalinism to expropriate their mortal enemies, private capitalism, and take over the exploitation of the workers themselves, replacing the old bourgeois state apparatus with their own. And this fundamental proposition, sociological proposition, the whole revisionist system of the Johnson Forest tendency follows. How do we arrive from private property capitalism to state capitalism? According to the Johnson Forest tendency who try to base themselves on a revision of Marx, state capitalism arises out of the process of centralization described by Marx in Volume One of Capital in the chapter on the general law of accumulation. It's worthwhile to spend just a little time on at least some of the fundamental economic propositions on which this whole edifice rests. In this chapter, Marx describes how the concentration of capital is affected by two processes, accumulated reproduction or the transformation of surplus value into new capital, and centralization or the combination of already existing capital. The absolute limit of this centralization, Marx shows, would be the combination of all capital into the hands of one capitalist or trust, even administered by the state. Should this theoretical possibility occur in one nation, the formation of an average rate of profit would be directly affected by the world market. And thus, there would still be no abrogation of the fundamental laws of capitalist economy. However, this is still an abstraction. Nowhere in the world, that is in the real world where the various laws of political economy of Marxism modify one another and clash with one another, nowhere in the real world has centralization reached its absolute limit. Even where an entire industry has been monopolized, it still functions as a competing segment of the total social capital of a nation or of world economy. 
Thus, it is impossible on this basis to say that centralization has produced state capitalism in any capitalist country in the world. The only place where such centralization has been affected, if you can call it centralization, is in the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. And this was not a result of the process of centralization in a capitalist country, the slow elimination of one capitalist by another, the result of the proletarian revolution. In Russia, property was statified, not by the process of capitalists eliminating each other, by workers overthrowing the bourgeoisie and placing themselves in power. However, Johnson Forrest argued that state capitalism exists in Russia because all the categories of capitalism are to be found there. They have value, price, commodities, wages, capital, etc. This reasoning is false to the core. These categories taken in their isolated form were found, many of them, in pre-capitalist society. But they were related to a different mode of production. Marx and Engels anticipated that wages and other capitalist categories would exist in the society transitional from capitalism to socialism. But Marx never considered that an economic system, the mode of production was the sum of its parts, the categories of production and circulation. An economic system is determined by its class structure. Feudalism is distinguished by the existence of the serf class, tied to the land, the owners of the land and the feudal nobility. Slave economy is distinguished by the producing class, the slave being the property of the slave owner. And capitalist society by the sale of labor power to the capitalist class, which owns the means of production. The class struggle and its origin are the determinants for the mode of production for Marxists. In Russia, the capitalist class was overthrown and has never been reinstated. Many categories of capitalism exist in the Soviet Union. If that weren't so, we'd have to revise our whole opposition to the theory of socialism in one country. But they exist within a qualitatively different context established by the October Revolution. Now, Johnson Forrest can explain all the similarities of the Soviet Union and world capitalism with their theory, but they can never explain the differences. For example, if there is a law of declining rate of profit, in classic sense in the Soviet Union, as they declare, why does it not operate in the Soviet Union to produce the depression prosperity cycle? I hope we don't get what uh, we got in California when we talked about capitalist depression. They said, well, there's a depressing situation in the Soviet Union also. <laughs> I want to deal with economic phenomena here, not with uh, puns. In the 30s, when world capitalism was in the grip of a paralyzing depression, which affected every segment of the capitalist world, the Soviet Union experienced its most rapid economic growth. Now, we don't ask that you refute this, just explain this, but cope with it. Don't ignore it. Isn't this an expression of qualitatively different economic systems? Now, Lenin's imperialism is for us, Marx's capital brought up to date. According to Johnson, it's been outmoded. Conservative, orthodox that we are, we haven't been persuaded by that theory yet. To us, imperialism is characterized by the export of capital. Nothing has changed in this respect. For some reason, which I shall touch on, becomes necessary to do violence to facts of the Johnson Forrest tendency. Let me cite the following passage, which appears in an asterisk on page 9. They say, the falling rate of profit is no longer theory. Like so much of Marx's abstract analysis, the proof is now before our eyes. 
Who in his senses today thinks that the world is suffering from an excess of capital? Where? In Britain? In France? In Italy? In Japan? In India? In Brazil? In China? Where? Pray, where? I'm still quoting. <laughs> from everywhere the cry rises for capital, the total mass of surplus value produced in relation to the total social capital is hopelessly inadequate. And then they say, sort of in passing, it may be useful, though we doubt this, to point out the fabulous profits of this or that company in the United States. This is no more than a variety of American exceptionalism. These profits will never be able to rebuild the world. And then, you know, tear into an agitational thought, Europe, China, India under capitalism will perish for lack of capital continue ever greater expansion. This capitalist system is finished, finished for good and all. Only the released proletariat can produce sufficiently to rebuild society. Everything is wrong with this. One doesn't know where to begin. And moreover, not, I don't think it's subjectively motivated, but it's a dishonest treatment of the world scene today. One doesn't list under the heading of where is there excess capital, every country in the world except the United States, the Colossus. <laughs> one doesn't take the one country that has sucked dry the marrow of the wealth of the whole world and has sort of incorporated into its own system loads and masses of capital which it is now trying to militarily subject the world place it in the possession in order to export it, goes to war in Korea, organizes a great Marshall Plan. One doesn't deal with that by saying there are a few corporations with fabulous profits, and then to shift the question and say it'll never rebuild the world. We never said, Lenin never said, that the export of capital rebuilds the world. It tears it down. Only the proletarian revolution and the economic society it will introduce will rebuild the world. You see, but Russia doesn't export capital. It imports it. As a matter of fact, it loots it. <laughs> How to obliterate this difference? Ignore it. In order to establish a qualitative identity between the Soviet Union and capitalism, a basic motivation of the whole structure here necessary to introduce a revision of Marxism in many fields of economics. If the overthrow of the monopoly capitalist is not the revolutionary task of the proletariat, but rather the work of the Stalinist stage of capitalism, what constitutes the content of the class struggle in a capitalist society without capitalists? For example, in the Trotsky esteem of the class struggle in Russia and the struggle against the bureaucracy and its basic content is a struggle against the restoration of private capitalism. The Johnson Forest reject all this. Private capitalism is dead and gone by and large. Where then is the source of the class struggle? It is in production, the Johnsonites tell us again and again and again, production. Here one is tempted to say that what is true is not new and what is new is not true. They destroy the function of capitalism, of the capitalist class in capitalist production by shifting the axis of the class struggle from the struggle over the rate of surplus value, determined not only by productivity, but also by wages, hours, and intensity of labor, all of it. The organization of the CIO, for example, placed a barrier in the path of the capitalist who seeks to stem his declining rate of profit by the simple expedient of reducing wages and lengthening hours. The only opening then becomes the increased intensity, becomes an important phenomenal expression 
of the capitalist attack on labor. This leads these communists to misconstrue the whole question, to look at the struggle over productivity, the capitalist conception of productivity, and the socialist conception of productivity as the central pivotal issue, and forget its source. Why this blatant revision on this point, for example? The productivity is a problem for Russia. Russia shares with the capitalist world the struggle for increased productivity. And the bureaucrats, in their own way, drive for productivity. Here's an identity. Seize upon it. And again, they must also abstract the capitalists out of the capitalist system and replace them with a bureaucracy. A class that doesn't produce for private profit, but simply sort of attached to capital as the exploiter of labor. A custodian whose master has died now has the whole works for himself. He even participated in killing the master. <laughs> The only opening then becomes the increased intensity, becomes an important phenomenal expression of the capitalist attack on labor. This leads these communists to misconstrue the whole question, to look at the struggle over productivity, the capitalist conception of productivity, and the socialist conception of productivity as the central pivotal issue and forget its source. Why this blatant revision on this point, for example? The productivity is a problem for Russia. Russia shares with the capitalist world the struggle for increased productivity. And the bureaucrats, in their own way, drive for productivity. Here is an identity. Seize upon it. And again, they must also abstract the capitalists out of the capitalist system and replace them with a bureaucracy, a class that doesn't produce for private profit, but simply sort of attach to capital as the exploiter of labor, a custodian whose master has died, now has the whole works for himself, he even participated in killing the master. <laughs> To accomplish this abstraction of the capitalist class from the capitalist system and replacing it by the Stalin's bureaucracy, it's more easily done by removing from consideration this question of the rate of surplus value and pushing to the fore productivity. The exploitation relation is seen by Johnson Forrest as the domination of the machine over the worker or the power of dead labor over living. In their use of these expressions, they assume a character of a fetishism. Absolutely no way around that. Marx described what is meant by a fetishism in the first volume of Capital, the fourth section of the first chapter. Such expressions like money is the root of all evil, money makes money, etc. A relation between persons concealed by an apparent relation between things. Money makes money only because the capitalist possession of it enables him to purchase the only value-creating commodity labor power. And in Johnsonian economics, we see a development of a fetish of capital along the same line. Ford isn't necessary to the Ford enterprises. We can agree with that from the standpoint of the proletarian revolution but he's very necessary to a capitalist Ford enterprise. What we have, they say, is a mass of capital that oppresses the worker. They take the Marxist understanding of the limitations imposed on the capitalist by the economic laws of value over which he has no control in order to eliminate the role of the capitalists without the proletarian revolution. 
Marx had a different notion of capitalism and capitalists. He showed in great detail how these laws operate through the individual capitalist. Determinist consciousness and how that in turn affects the movement of the objective process. And the most safeguarded principle of capitalist law is freedom for investment. The capitalist wants to live without labor. He wants to make an honest dollar without soiling his hands. If I hear the word subjectivism again in relation to this, I'll have to say what one of the communists in Los Angeles said, we're not dealing with the movement of planets in sociology. We're dealing with human beings, classes. Marx was the first to understand that. Motivated by the struggle of privilege, economic gain. That's the capitalist class. It isn't an automaton like your worker. The right to appropriate the surplus labor of others is the cardinal principle of capitalist production. The drive to increase productivity is only the means to this end, and not the end in itself. I want to turn to another aspect of this whole question, to the political aspect. We want to intervene in Yugoslavia, in the Tito-Stalin split, to start with. In order to help in the process of developing a world party of revolution. To us, the appearance of the split in the ranks of world Stalinism was the occasion of probing every possibility. Find the revolutionary forces, help them find their way to Trotskyism. And to us, this is of prime importance because we see the problem of the world revolution, that is, the problem of humanity as the problem of creating the requisite revolutionary leadership, an irreconcilable struggle with Stalinism, centrism, and reformism. This concept, comrades of the Johnson Forest tendency wish to throw out of the window, along with all of Trotskyism. One doesn't have to dig and imply this is what they state. They say, on page 33 of their recent document. The first sentence of the transitional program states that the crisis of revolution is the crisis of revolutionary leadership. This is the reiterated theme. And they say, exactly the opposite is the case. It is the crisis of the self-mobilization of the proletariat. As we shall show, and it is perfectly obvious logically, this theme of orthodox Trotskyism implies that there is a competition for leadership, and that whereas the other internationals are betrayed, the fourth international will be honest. Exactly the contrary must be the analysis. Here we want to ask, why was the proletariat defeated since 1917? not an unimportant question. It's perhaps the question that our movement has preoccupied itself with, as well as the corollary question, how can the proletariat come to victory? He who does not know the reason for these defeats cannot prepare victory. It is not a crisis of leadership, but of the self-mobilization of the masses. In all the situations where the mass mobilization of the proletariat reached the highest point of intensity, Germany, 1918 to 1923, China, Spain, France, Europe after the Second World War, why were they defeated? Were they doomed in advance? Had the stage of state capitalism failed to appear in sufficient development to mature the conditions? This is ludicrous. It isn't even contended. So because the objective situation was unripe? The working class practically took power into its hands over and over again, as far as their self-mobilization was concerned. 
It isn't that they didn't even reach the point of taking power. They took the power. It was snatched from their hands by the leadership. In every case, there was a problem of the crisis of leadership. It remains only to blame the proletariat or to descend into mysticism. The Johnson Forrest tendency reject a contest for leadership. That is, they reject the struggle to build a revolutionary party. They hurl the Bolshevik conception over their right shoulder and they assign the task to the proletariat. Mobilize yourselves. And we will act as an expression of your self-mobilization. They talk about the unique situation of mass parties that appeared suddenly on the scene after the Second World War. They say, blind to facts, they say, Lenin never conceived of a mass party of two and a half million before the struggle for power. I can't for the life of me understand what they mean by this. The party of two and a half million, that must be the Italian Communist Party. It must mean that that's a unique feature of the modern development. The proletariat mobilizes in large parties. But wherein is this unique? Before the First World War, we had the mass mobilization of the proletariat in the Second International. After the First World War, in the Second and Third International, in the interim between the two wars, and after the Second World War, aside from that, it's very unique. We contend that the element of the readiness of the proletariat, or its self-mobilization, if you please, has over and over again demonstrated itself. He who does not understand that the struggle, yes, the contest for leadership, is like the Bolsheviks contested for leadership against the social revolutionaries and the Mensheviks, will help the working class realize this self-mobilization and victory. That's what the struggle is about. Now, in this theory, the Stalinists are assigned a historic role. They're not class collaborationists. Let me quote this. The Stalinists are not class collaborationists, fools, cowards, idiots, men with supple spines, but conscious, clear-sighted aspirants for world power. They are deadly enemies of private property capitalism. They aim to seize the power, take the place of the bourgeoisie, when they support a war or do not support, support the bourgeoisie or do not support, they know exactly what they are doing. The bourgeoisie also knows. In fact, everybody, including most workers, know this, except orthodox Trotskyism. There's a strange disclosure in this passage. There's even a grain of truth in it. The popular opinion is faithfully stated. It really is true that almost everybody holds this point of view, including the non-orthodox Trotsky. They all hold the view that Stalinism is a revolutionary force. They divide on Stalinism as a matter of taste. Stalinists and some sections of the neo-Stalinists, the revolutionary force, that's good enough. Let's not fool around with 10th rate issues of method and ethics and all the rest of that. The bourgeoisie and all their ideologists and theoreticians call it a revolutionary force, mortal enemies of the capitalist system. And the Johnson Forrest tendency calls it a revolutionary force if you want to think things through. The methodology is the same. They only add that this whole revolution, the elimination of the whole capitalist system as we know it, that's only a change in the stage of capitalism, doesn't require the proletarian intervention. And they say, moreover, this stage brings the revolution closer than ever before. Why? That we don't know. So 
the very revolutionary conception that the revolution is closer than ever before. But when it's taken up in regard to concrete questions of revolutionary action of the proletariat, everything changes. When the real proletariat moves, that is that proletariat weighed down by false leadership, that proletariat which has stolen the social democratic leadership, that proletariat we ignore. Little wonder that they reject our whole conception of the Yugoslav revolution and our tasks. Now, a typical question raised by comrades in all parts of the country who have expressed certain reservations about our resolution is as follows. Did we call it a worker state because of the indications of a favorable leftward development in the ideological life of the YCP? You can see at once that uh, that method would lead to great difficulties because we have a very unfavorable development in the rightward turn in foreign policy. Surely our resolution and our method isn't predicated on that superficial premise. We call it a worker state because upon investigation, thought, the collective work of our whole movement nationally, by examining the dynamics of the revolution, the class relations in that revolution, the workers destroyed the capitalist state apparatus, And with a whole series of moves characterized by stumbling, lack of consciousness, ideological lags, they erected their own state apparatus and took the power. That's the basic reason. And then proceeded to transform the country socially and economically. The break with the Kremlin gave us a clue. No one will deny this. There were some perspicacious comrades in periodicals of the Fourth International that saw the development in its earliest phase. I read an article by Comrade Wright in 1943, put its finger on the heart of the development of the revolution at that time. It starts out with the idea a civil war is taking place in Yugoslavia and we take sides in that civil war. It's only necessary to bring the analysis up to date. Now I have a few minutes for a brief presentation of what is called the related question. I want to explain, I don't think the chairman did, that I'm on my own now. <laughs> I was speaking for the majority of the political committee. Although maybe a point here and there wasn't quite right, but here I take full responsibility. I can really go wild. But what I really want to do is attempt to characterize this international discussion that we've had. There are really three questions under discussion in Yugoslavia, which I won't deal with any further. The buffer zone and the nature of the Stalinist parties throughout the world. I want to remark here that the Johnson Forest tendency entered this discussion with a cry of chaos. The house is burning down. Everybody run. Look at all the opinions. Look at all the conflicting currents in the discussion. This is chaos. We weren't impressed by that cry. Our view is the opposite. It's the richest, most profound ideological discussion our international has experienced since the death of the old man. The discussion in every respect has been tied to the best traditions of conscientious Marxist method. In the first place, it's a discussion that takes account of facts. Like on the Russian question, I always remember the old man used to dig up the facts, analyze them painstakingly from week to week, write books and pamphlets about them. 
the ultra leftists and the centrists, they never bothered with that question. They took the facts as Trotsky presented them. And then as he said, they, where he drew the figure of a woman's face, they made a mustache. <laughs> if he had a chicken, they put an egg under it. Just caricaturizing the real analysis. I think we should be proud of the fact that our Kermans have followed in the very best tradition of Trotsky's method. They watch the development, explore. I think another thing that's important about this discussion is that despite the fact that it deals with the most profound questions of the epoch, entailing the very basic criteria of Marxism, it has been a discussion in the freest and most comradely spirit. And then in that sense, no one has felt pinned down, no one has felt forced to defend everything you said yesterday in a factional sense. The logic of the discussion appears to me has been to arrive at clarity and even agreement on very important points. And as for chaos, the first expression of chaos, ideological chaos in the workers' movement, is its incapacity to act. Paralysis, multiplication of views on what to do in every situation, and more often than not, abstentionism, do nothing, discuss. The Fourth International has shown every tendency while conducting a theoretical discussion to act decisively and in a unified way in all the basic turning points of the world situation. That too is evidence of the nature of this discussion. Up to now, the big point in the discussion has been what is the class character of the buffer zone? What attitude should we take to it tactically? The difficulty arises, in my opinion, not from the first period, where it was clear and evident that the Stalinist bureaucracy moved in as part of a deal with Allied imperialism after crushing the Axis, a deal which the clear and simple bargain was that the Stalinists would crush the revolution in Europe, which they did, and in Eastern Europe. In return, they would get territory. First period, I don't think, offers theoretical difference. Capitalist class, although great numbers of them had fled, taken all their possessions out of the country. I think the Stalinists managed to get a hold of enough of them to put them into cabinets and to try to install a capitalist stability and to deal with them. For my part, as more development and more information comes, the important feature is the sweeping elimination of capitalism expropriation by the military bureaucratic method. The question arises, shall we then call them degenerated worker states? In my opinion, the difficulty with this formula is that to us the degenerated worker state is an inclusive definition. And included in that definition is a victorious revolution which suffered degeneration and counter-revolutionary Stalinist growth. And this does not correspond, that type of definition taken in its rich meaning does not correspond to the reality in the buffer zone. Shall we then say neither worker states nor capitalist states, a new phenomena? But we are all agreed that this phenomena and it has certain new aspects, undoubtedly, notwithstanding the Baltics and Eastern Poland. We're all agreed that it's a limited, historically unviable, a byproduct of a byproduct. My own view is that the whole process has been one of destroying these states as states, incorporating them in one form or another into the USSR. The bureaucratic military method in the first place of social transformations leaves no room for independent existence. Does this elimination of capitalism in such a large section of Europe open up a re-evaluation of Stalinism? I don't think so, not at all. If we see the processes in, in its entirety, we see that the first and foremost function of Stalinism 
was to crush the real vital force, the revolutionary proletariat, in Western Europe and in Eastern Europe. And to leave then the whole process to become mangled and deformed in the hands of the bureaucracy. Nothing at all is revolutionary about Stalinism. And as regards the Stalinist parties, in my opinion, the best example and here I return to Yugoslavia is the lesson to be learned from Yugoslavia. Stalinist parties can be transformed. I don't see that that's a basic new thought in our program. If we can't take parties, or if history doesn't take parties that have hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of worker adherents, and in the crises of revolution, transform these parties, split them, break them up, introduce all forms of changes in them, then it leads to a conception of the incapacity of the proletariat. Our task is simply to recognize where, how, and when these transformations take place and to intervene. It opens possibilities of regroupment of forces to the Trotskyist party. We must find that every new situation, as Trotsky taught us, the premises for revolutionary action in each new situation, a road to the masses to help them tear loose from Stalinism and capitalism. I want to conclude with the question of the right swing in foreign policy in Yugoslavia. Its basic reasons are not unknown to us. We have traced them. We are traced in this resolution. Yugoslavia as a workers' revolution in a backward country, besieged by both the power of the Kremlin and world imperialism, enormous difficulties in the development of that revolution. We have to point to another factor aside from the momentary and very important fact of a drought and a threatened famine, you have the continuation of the centrism of the YCP. You have two contrary trends. Internally, the revolution and the policy of the Revolutionary Party has been moving leftward, even beyond some of our best expectations. Externally, in foreign policy, there has been a rapid shift to the right. One has to understand that these two problems will not be isolated, as the Yugoslavs hope. They will meet, and they will come back home. The demands of the Vatican, for example, and of all the capitalist agencies about freedom for prisoners is not simply a civil liberties demand, I assure you. They are trying to knock out one of the fundamental props of the existence of the worker state in, the, in Yugoslavia. The constant pressure of the peasantry, of the richer middle peasantry on the worker state must be understood. If they try to break through the monopoly of foreign trade or the restrictions on the free market, the worker state is compelled to use measures of imprisonment an action against these capitalist elements. The demand will broaden, lay off these people, introduce the free market, give us concessions, one thing after another. If these centrists, empiricists, imagine that they're going to outwit Truman, that is to say Wall Street, they could outwit Truman, Imagine they're going to outwit Wall Street. They'll find out differently. They'll be taken by the throat. The real demand will be placed. We've got to watch for that. There's no doubt that great harm and damage has been done. The prestige of the Yugoslav Revolution to the consciousness of the world working class and the possibilities of alliances with the colonial people. The issue is not decided. We do not put a cross over the Yugoslav revolution on the basis 
of this very ominous trend. Our task is not only to criticize the Yugoslav Communist Party, and we must criticize them, we have to expose the murderous squeeze of Wall Street. We have to do everything in our power to arouse pressure against the squeeze to expose what they are doing. We will watch with great interest and as partisans of the struggle every further development. The extension of the October Revolution and the defense of all its conquests from imperialist attack, that has been the strategic line of our movement. The Yugoslav Revolution, despite all its ebbs and flows, is a gigantic step forward for the world proletariat. And now for us, the defense of the Yugoslav Revolution from both the rapacious designs of imperialism and the threatening attack of counter-revolutionary Stalinism now enters as an integral part of our strategic line. Chairman, comrades, the reporter for the majority well merited the ovation he received. It was a report worthy of the 14th Convention of our party. I shall do my best to keep the discussion on the high level to which he has raised it. I learned a lot in this greatest university of our movement. I am sure the convention as a whole, with a few exceptions, learned too. about the majority reporter's tact, restraint, and grace, to say nothing of his encyclopedic knowledge of the most esoteric literature has better, ever been my fortune, or rather misfortune, to be acquainted with. As to matching him in that, I don't know. I associate myself, of course, wholeheartedly with that section of his speech devoted to the political and economic treatment of the Forrest Johnson School. And although it will take up the time of the convention, as well as my own, it would be impermissible to simply say that, say that and go on, even though the treatment was comprehensive, considering the brief time it had to be packed in. It is necessary, in my opinion, for me to touch upon one aspect of the Forrest Johnson economic theory. One of their lesser claims contributions is that they have superseded Lenin at least so far as the theory of imperialism is concerned. Now let's take that proposition that their theory of state capitalism supersedes the theory of imperialism. Let's take it from the standpoint of the dialectical content. 
Imperialism has decayed. State capitalism is far, far worse decay. You can't get any further. It's absolute. You pass from one stage of decay to its utmost stage. Lenin thought capitalism had reached its highest, final stage with imperialism. Well, he's been proved wrong to the satisfaction, at least, of a group of comrades. Now, how is that dialectical transition achieved from decay to the same category at a higher stage through revolution? Now, Engels used to find Hegel's transitions enjoyable. Lenin did not. He admitted they often gave him headaches. This transition of the Forrest Johnson school appears to be dialectical in form. But when you look at the content, it's nonsense. There can be no such dialectical transitions. Let's take it on the economical plane. If imperialism is the high stage is not the highest stage of capitalism, capitalist development, but state capitalism is, you would expect to find it by all the rules, at least the formal logic, to manifest itself in the most advanced countries in the world. Where should decay be most manifest? And along with it, its expression, state capitalism, if not in the most advanced country. That is the United States. Imperialism found its expression, highest expression, in Lenin's day in the most advanced countries. Where do the Forrest Johnson School find it? In the most backward countries in the world. They were, at least, before the revolution opened the door to his decay. I'm sure the uh, state capitalism in Yugoslavia, from their point of view, let me pass on now to their system of philosophy. In this field, they skirt dangerously close, if not become virtually identifiable with the opponents of not only dialectical materialism, but the materialist school of thought as a whole. What they call their universals, especially their all-embracing universals, unfold in history and materialize in history in a manner strikingly reminiscent of the unfolding and the materialization of the Hegelian absolute idea. The universal of Johnson Forrest, like the absolute of Hegel, materializes only when history is fully ripe for it, and not an instant before. Just as the all-embracing universal Hegel called the absolute. If you want their philosophy in a nutshell, you will find it on page 66 of their latest bulletin, although I may be a little behind the time. I'll read it to you. All previous distinctions, politics, 
and economics, war and peace, agitation and propaganda, party and mass, individual and society, national, civil, and imperialist war, single country and one world, immediate needs and ultimate solutions, all these it is impossible to keep separate any longer. Total planning is inseparable from the permanent crisis, the world struggle for the minds of men from the world tendency to complete mechanization of men. Now what's there left out of this formula in the real world as we know it? Nothing. Now one must indeed use a special method, special spectacles, to obtain such a view of our world today. You can do it by using the method of Marx, Engels, Lenin and Trotsky. That's correct. But this method does fall in its own special way within the province of the German school of dialectic philosophy, and you may add old Hegel to it too. But to give him his due, that is to Hegel, he never imposed such inexorable necessity on his system as the Forrest Johnson tendency do on theirs. Hegel was far more flexible he at least left ample room for the interplay between chance necessity and necessary chance. Let me now pass on to the defense of the resolution Pardon me, the memorandum that is before you. My task has been made much easier by the historical review and its analysis presented to you by the majority reporter, especially the treatment of the problem of dual power to which the burden of the rest of my remarks will be committed. As the discussion on Yugoslavia passed through its different phases, all the more acutely has the problem of dual power confronted us. This problem, superimposed on the dispute over criteria or method of em to employ in characterizing a revolution, tangled up still more the already complicated Yugoslav question. I am sorry to say that on the question of dual power, many comrades have proceeded as empirically as they did on the question of criteria. Some of our co-thinkers the reporter himself, and it's also in the majority resolution, made an important contribution toward the solution of the problem we are trying to solve. And that is that you cannot solve it at a stroke because it wasn't solved that way in Yugoslavia. It can only be solved in stages. Is this consistent with our theory and historical facts? Indeed, it is. Let me review the problem as it appears historical. The English Revolution of the 17th century posed the problem of dual power, as every revolution does. There it was solved in several stages. This revolution wrote the old man was a clear example of this alternating dual power 
with sharp transitions in the form of civil war. The great French Revolution of the 18th century was uh, solved in a much more complicated way. Here, the revolution not only ascended, but also the counter-revolution descended, as the old man put it, by steps of dual power. And each of the stages was characterized by a sharply marked double sovereignty. All this took place over a period not of weeks or months, but I repeat, several years. Now, as this appearance over entire prolonged periods of conditions in society where you cannot say that this or that class has the power, is that consistent with our basic theoretical approach? I turn now to the good book. That is the history of the Russian Revolution, to the chapter on dual power, where the old man poses this very question. Does this phenomenon of the dual power, heretofore not sufficiently appreciated, contradict the Marxian theory of the state, which regards the government as an executive committee of the ruling class? This is just the same as asking, he says, does the fluctuation of prices under the influence of supply and demand contradict the labor theory of value? Does the self-sacrifice of a female protecting her offspring refute the theory of a struggle for existence? No. In these phenomena, we have a more complicated combination of the same laws. If the state is an organization of class rule, and a revolution is the overthrow of the ruling class, then the transfer of power from one class to another must necessarily create self-contradictory state conditions. And first of all, the form of dual power. Now, let me repeat this. When you're dealing with dual power within it, you have one stage of dual power passing into another stage of dual power, possibly a civil war intervening, another due stage of dual power, until and unless the relationship is stabilized and the question is no longer posed through class relations as to who is the master at home. In Yugoslavia, what have we had in terms of stages? At least one civil war, and following it, at least four distinct governments. There was the Avnoi, the anti-fascist Council of Liberation, established the Bihać in November 1941. There was the Tito Subasic United Yugoslav National Government, formally announced in March 1945, but first negotiated in June of 44 and agreed to in principle by the end of 44. This government terminates existence in October 1945 and was followed by another government, which continued until the kicking out of the Stalinist ministers in Tito's cabinet, I believe it was sometime in 1948. If the withdrawal of the last two bourgeois ministers in 1945 cannot be overlooked by us, Neither then can we dismiss as an important governmental change of kicking out the two most prominent and powerful Stalinist ministers in the same cabinet.
Now, no one can simply by inspection from determining at least the number of stages and governments you've had, then attempt to characterize the, the nature of these successive governments. You can't do it by inspection. Next, you must at least establish the specific peculiarities of the whole process. Truth is concrete. Now, let me now list some of these peculiarities, not necessarily in the order of their importance. First, the admittedly prolonged duration of dual power. Some of our co-thinkers have proposed that we accept the period of 45-46 as the date when dual power was finally completely resolved and a new state was born. If you count from Bihach, this fixes approximately five to six years as falling into dual power. If you count Yaitse, he gives you a year less. Some um, comments of the majority uh, say it was longer, others say it was short. From my analysis and study, I am firmly convinced that the year 1950 also falls under that heading. There is still a dual power system in Belgrade. Peculiarity number two, the highly contradictory character of the entire process. The Yugoslav revolution has evolved in extremely tortuous ways marked by sudden halts, which have been preceded and followed by dizzy swings, now to the right, now to the left. Let me illustrate. Shortly after the Nazis overrun Yugoslavia, the YCP issued a call for insurrection. That's certainly a swing to the left, as compared especially with previously followed policy. But no sooner was this done than the YCP leadership starts scurrying around for allies, People's Front allies, anything and anybody except fascists and collaborators, and above all, Draja Mikhailovich and his Chetniks, who had also set up a certain dual power system. That certainly was a swing to the right. Negotiations with Mikhailovich fall through and the partisans fight on their own, now battling both the fascists plus Mikhailovich. That's a swing to the left. You get more negotiations with Mikhailovich. That's a swing to the right. You get a final break with Mikhailovich. Swing to the left. You get the formation of the Avnoi. That's certainly a swing to the left. And then apparently the Kremlin has become a very important factor in the situation and tones down the program and propaganda, a swing to the right. The extremely convulsive movements in the early days take place, of course, in unexplained by conditions of civil war. The war is over, the tempo tends to slow down. But throughout, you get the same alterations. Skipping to 1948, the break with the Kremlin, Obviously a swing to the left. And for a period of a whole, almost two years, an attempt to reach some sort of deal, some sort of a status quo agreement, certainly a swing to the right. And of course, as Comrade uh, Weiss pointed out, this year we witnessed both the sharpest swing to the left and the sharpest swing to the right since the coalition government with the Yugoslav bourgeoisie in 45. Now, such convulsive zigzags have their origin not alone in the character of a given leadership and its particular policy, but also in the unstable correlation of class forces inside the country, which create a self-contradictory situation. 
which is transmitted through the leadership precisely because of its particular character, which is dual in a different sense. It's dual in that it expresses a pressure not of a single class, but of at least two classes when it happens to be centrist. This alteration of swings coincides with the peaks in the stages that follow in a dual power condition. It's one of the characteristics and one of the reasons why I cannot accept the revolution as accomplished. Let me say in passing that those comrades who persist in employing a single factor or group of factors, nationalizations, for example, or reforms, for example, as the decisive criterion to characterize the revolution in Yugoslavia or anywhere else, are only hindering their own education. And that wouldn't be so bad, it's bad enough, but that hinders the education of the party. Let me go on to the third peculiarity, the character of the Yugoslav party. Here we have something peculiar to the point of uniqueness. A centrist party plunging into a civil war, leading it, winning it, and remaining in power to this very day. This has never happened before. Not in the history of proletarian struggle. Can we say, really, it was a Stalinist party, as some comrades incline? Here I go uh, much further than they apparently are prepared to. Its basic cadre was undoubtedly trained in a Stalinist school. But the party as a whole, as it passed through this experience, in its vast majority, received its training in the battlefields of the Civil War. How many members this party originally started with? I don't think anybody really knows. But it is common knowledge that it was in no sense a mass party at the outset. Probably not much larger than our own caterer, if that large. Certainly nowhere near as large as the one that emerged from the Civil War. Now, Comrade Stewart, on the basis of scanty and extremely tendentious information available years ago deduced from the partisan program that this party must have lost all contact with Moscow. This truly noteworthy contribution to our clear understanding of the Yugoslav events at the time passed unnoticed. This has since then been fully confirmed. The opportunity of this party to pass through such an experience, relatively brief to it may have been, in a condition of civil war, being able to operate independently from Stalin's intervention, left an indelible imprint from the caterers. And that took place quite early. It may well have played a decisive role. In, play, in molding the powers, fighting ranks and leadership, as Comrade Clark suggests. There is in addition another circumstance that I recommend very strongly to the Comrade's consideration. It merits very close study. The YCP from the beginning of organized partisan activity to the end of the Civil War was more of an army than a political party as we know it. In this respect, you can draw a certain parallel between the political role of the army under Cromwell and that of the partisans under Tito. And also, there is a parallel in the form of dual power assumed. In both cases, we find what Trotsky called a territorial form of dual power with swiftly shifting boundaries. Now there's not only uh, a tendency to agree, there's complete agreement here with the presentation of the majority report. 
This parallel is all the more interesting because Stalin, unlike Cromwell in all other respects, nevertheless, like Cromwell, eventually learned that army parties readily give birth to new dual power systems. In Cromwell's case, the dual power of the levelers never had a chance to unfold. It was easily nipped in the bud because this class it represented had not yet historically matured. In Stalin's case, it proved otherwise. The dual power system of the partisan succeeded in surviving. Let's come now to peculiarity number four. But before I do that, you must uh, weigh things before you decide that this was really a Stalinist party at the beginning. Not that, I de uh, not that I'm one of those who think that a party that is actually Stalinist, not only in its formal training, but through and through, cannot under certain conditions move away from Stalinism. It would be rash to do so. But in my opinion, it is extremely significant that, say, in China, you had an army party. And the Chinese Stalinists, while well, you must draw distinctions, in that respect, appear to have passed under different conditions to an experience similar to that in Yugoslavia. Let's come to peculiarity number four. In a private conversation, one comrade put it about as follows. In Yugoslavia, events seem to have unfolded just the reverse of the Russian Revolution. Under the Bolsheviks, first came the seizure of power, then came civil war. Under the partisans, first came the civil war and the seizure of power in the sense of the proletarian revolution sometime later. Now, I couldn't quite make out clearly what Murray's own date is. But some of our co-thinkers insist on Yaitse of 1943. A Yaitse unquestionably played an important role in the history of the Yugoslav Civil War, in the evolution of the partisan movement, and perhaps also in the succession of partisan dual power systems that follow. But one thing is sure, Bihać is at least as important. Bihać is the Bosnian town where one year earlier than Yaitse, the Avnoi was actually launched, paving the way for the Yaitse meeting. The partisans at Bihać did not formally assume, let single out Yaitse, also say that what emerged there was a workers and peasants government. De jure, a legally constituted one. If you assume that that is so, it is necessary then also to grant that there was at least a de facto workers and peasants government set up at Bihać. Personally, I would much rather use Trotsky's formula for a, uh, an army party form of dual power than the transitional formula he supplied in the foundation program and used by Carmen Germain. I think it is far more correct to define both Bihać and Yaitse as a territorial form of dual power set up by the partisans. In any case, if we mean the same thing, both of us, a compromise on terminology can readily be reached. But do we? Is it properly recognized that not only the same parties, but the very same leaders participated, both at Bihać and Yaitse? How many parties were there? You heard one, and only one. That's precisely because why all the other parties, especially the peasant parties, became so discredited. That's why all the other leaders in Yugoslavia, formerly politically permanent, Prominent, pardon me. Lost all their prestige, their following, and some later even their lives. The slew of other so-called parties and groups allegedly comprising the liberation movement were all facades for the partisans, and little more. 
It was this party army that won and led the Civil War. Now, what happened then? The party partisan dual power system ceded place to a Tito Subasic coalition. The ruling party still remained the same as at Bihach and Yaitse. So did all the leading figures, barring a few notable exceptions, such as Cardelli, who now became a deputy foreign minister for Subasic. Six capitalist ministers walked in and were given cabinet posts with or without portfolios. It was characterized here as a Trojan horse policy, followed by the coalition and by the Kremlin, agreed to by the Kremlin. Now, it's wrong to dismiss this as a mere episode. It marked a new stage in dual power, the emergence of a new dual power system with the Trojan horse policy apparently in reverse. Because from all indications, the bourgeois ministers were virtual captives in Tito's cabinet. At any rate, Foreign Minister Subasic was. At the first Big Five Council meeting of ministers held in London during the Tito Subasic regime, it was attended by Cardelli and not Subasic.